For this video, I'm assuming that you already have a good understanding of the distinction between deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning, that you've had some introduction to inductive reasoning. And we are now looking at very specific types of inductive arguments. And this is part one of a two-part series. And in this case, we're looking at two very common inductive argument forms. The first form that we are considering is that of a statistical syllogism. And this can be described as reasoning in the following way. If you have an individual that's known to belong to a larger group, and a very large proportion of that group has a certain characteristic, then you can conclude that the individual has that characteristic as well. So for example, we have this argument. Over 90% of students in Philosophy 140 are from Illinois. Mike is a student in Philosophy 140, therefore Mike is from Illinois. A reasonable argument, a reasonable conclusion to draw from the premises. We can express the broad form of what's going on with a statistical syllogism in this way. We have a percentage statement, so X percent of all Fs are Gs. Now we'll qualify that in just a little bit. Then we have the individual, or sometimes it might just be a smaller group, not a particular individual. But in this case, we have an individual A is an F, and we conclude from that that A is a G. And we can be a little bit more technical, and F is going to be the reference class, the broader group that we know the individual belongs in. And then G is the attribute class, the subset that has that particular characteristic that we're concerned about, in this case, being from Illinois. Let's consider the standards of strength for statistical syllogisms. There are two that we are going to consider. The first one is closeness to 100% or 0%, depending on the related claims, the premises are making the statistical claim is as, what is this? Let's consider the standards of strength for statistical syllogisms. There are two that we should consider that are very significant for evaluating statistical syllogisms. The first one is the closeness to 100% or 0%. So the premise making the statistical claim is as strong as its nearness to the extremes of percentages. Of course, depending on how it's set up, that would be either 100% or 0%. The first argument we saw, the nearness to 100% was significant. Here, let's consider a different kind of argument. We have the premise only 1% of house cats are smart, and Tuffy is a house cat, so we conclude that Tuffy is not smart. Now here, since 1% is very close to 0%, this is a good argument. This is a strong argument. Since the conclusion is negative, right, Tuffy is not smart, and it's related to the statistical claim in the proper way, right, only 1%, then the argument as a whole is strong. Now, when statistical claims near 50% are used, we have a nearly worthless statistical syllogism. It becomes very weak. Now, there are no precise cutoffs. 90% or 10% or, or below, but it's toward those ends, you know, near 90 or above, around 10 or below, that's what you need to make a good statistical syllogism. If you're talking about 30 to 70% ranges, those are not going to be very good. Now, not all statistical syllogisms have numbers in their premises. So a statistical syllogism could say nearly all or almost none or similar phrases in these statistical premises, and they could still be strong. The second standard of strength for a statistical syllogism is that of the degree to which relevant data has been considered. 
or the rule of total evidence. Now, this requires some background knowledge about the topic you are talking about in order to assess what's relevant and what's not. So for example, related to the previous argument about Tuffy the cat, if it's known that Tuffy can do amazing pet tricks, then that information needs to be considered when evaluating the above argument about house cats. So depending on how you evaluate SMART, we won't worry about that. But if you already know that Tuffy could do these pet tricks, then he is likely to be an exception to the general rule. And so it would be improper to draw the conclusion that we did. Now, making an error by neglecting relevant data is committing the fallacy of incomplete evidence, or this is when you fail to take into account the rule of total evidence. The second form that we will consider is that of the inductive generalizations. This is probably the most common type of inductive argumentation, so very important form to be familiar with. This occurs when there are members of a subset out of a larger population that have a characteristic in a certain proportion. And then it may be concluded that the group as a whole, the larger population, has that characteristic in the same proportion. So for example, of the 45 students initially enrolled in a class held on the WIU campus, 15 live off campus, and from that, we conclude about a third of the students at Western live off campus. Now, moving on with other types of inductive generalizations, we have political polls, quality control methods. These rely on inductive generalizations. The, the methodology in doing political polling is almost always an inductive generalization, the same with quality control and many other types of arguments. So we have this general form. We have X percent of observed Fs are Gs, and from that we conclude X percent of all Fs are Gs. And so a quality control argument might go like this. Tests showed that 99 out of 100 Goodyear tires tested on September 12th we're free of defect. And from that, we conclude that 99% of all Goodyear tires made are free of defect. Now, notice that unlike statistical syllogisms, which draw conclusions about an individual, or in some cases, a smaller group than what is mentioned in the premises, an inductive generalization draws conclusions about larger groups. So we're going from merely 100 Goodyear tires to a statement about all Goodyear tires, which are surely in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or probably millions. Standards of strength for inductive generalizations include, first of all, making sure that the sample is large enough. Now, the second one is the sample must have sufficient variety from within it. Now, often background information is going to be needed in order to determine whether these principles are kept. So more knowledge about statistical research is extremely helpful in making sure that you are conducting an inductive generalization properly. Now, in terms of the sufficient variety, in order to assure that, it's often done with random sampling, or sometimes stratified random sampling is used. So I assume that you know what random sampling is. Stratified random, random sampling is done when you assure the smaller group that you're looking at, the smaller group that's sampled, represents the entire group that you're drawing conclusions about well. And so the characteristics should be proportional to those in a larger group. If you were doing a poll of some kind, typically if you wanted to do stratified random sampling, you would need to take into consideration socioeconomic status, race, sex, uh, whether we're looking at urban or rural population, 
all of those things should match the broader population, whether that's of a state or the, a whole country. You need to be sampling those that have the same proportion of the characteristics that are used. There are certain fallacies related to inductive generalizations. We're going to consider a, a few of these. First, we need to remind ourselves that fallacies occur when we, when we violate the standards of strength that we just mentioned. So if the sample is not large enough, then the fallacy of insufficient evidence is committed. Now, sometimes this might be called hasty generalization or jumping to conclusions. More technically, it's the fallacy of insufficient evidence. So for example, if I conclude that only 30% of Western students are male because about 30% of students in my metaphysics course are male, I'm likely not considering a large enough sample. I'm, we're talking about a, a dozen to a couple dozen students and we're drawing conclusions about several thousand students and so the sample size is going to be too small to do that. And a second fallacy that might occur is when you lack sufficient variety in your sample. And then you have the fallacy of biased statistics. So for example, if you want to know the public's attitude toward building a nuclear power plant, and you want to consider what the state as a whole say the population of the state of Illinois has uh, to say about it. And then if you only poll those who are living near that site that's proposed, and then you from that draw conclusions about the general population around the state, then you will have biased statistics. You need to consider everyone if your goal is to know what everyone in the state thinks about the proposed nuclear power plant. Another fallacy that is associated with inductive arguments is the fallacy of misleading vividness. So this occurs when an especially vivid exception to the general data is provided as reasoning for question the questioning the conclusion that you drew from the inductive reasoning. So for example, suppose, uh, as is the case typically with me, I want to buy a new car, so I, want, I decide that I'm going to look at the customer satisfaction, the reliability data, the repurchasing statistics for that particular year, make, and model, and then once I find one that I think is exceptional in those categories, I draw a conclusion that this would be a good type of car to get. But then suppose that I find out that someone I know has one of those vehicles and they say, it's a complete lemon. I'm in the shop all the time. It's horrible, don't buy that year, make and model. Well, if I change my mind because of that, if it's a mistake. That's a fallacy of misleading vividness. So if you really think that customer satisfaction, reliability data, repurchasing, repurchasing statistics, those things are what are important to consider, that's a good way of evaluating of when to buy a car, not a care, a car, then a dramatic anecdote shouldn't sway your thinking on that. Now, how can we improve an inductive generalization? One of these makes complete sense, very intuitive. One of them is a little bit harder for students to grasp. Since the standards of strengths of inductive arguments are related to the degree that the premises support the conclusion, the inductive arguments, inductive generalizations can be strengthened by strengthening the premises that would be through having a larger sample size or including more variety or using stratified random sampling, those things would strengthen the premises. So that would make your argument better. Or 
you could do it by weakening the conclusion. So again, let's go back to the argument regarding tires, where we had 99 out of 100, and then we drew the conclusion about 99% of the tires are free of defect. You could strengthen the premises in that argument by increasing the size of the sample. So if you sampled 3,000 tires instead of merely 100, and you find that 2,970 are free of defect, well, that's 99%. That gives you all the more reason to accept the conclusion. It strengthens the argument. Now, alternatively, instead of concluding that 99% of Goodyear tires are free of defect after observing 100 tires, a weaker conclusion makes the argument as a whole stronger. So what would be a weaker conclusion? For example, the claim that greater than 95% of the tires are free of defect. It's a weaker statement, right? It's, it's easier for it to be true. And so that's why the argument is going to be stronger. It makes more sense that it's true. So these are two types of inductive reasoning forms, statistical syllogism, inductive generalizations. They are, are excellent forms, very common, very broadly used. And now you know these strengths that you should be looking for. And in contrary to that, if they are weak, you know how to evaluate whether or not they are weak. And then in, in the case of these inductive generalizations, you can see how the argument could be made into a better argument. Now, we continue with other argument forms in part two on this topic.